Ben Woodruff here with another Falconry video. Today's video I'm really excited to do. It's actually kind of a remake, but an important topic, and that is the subject of American Kestrels and American Kestrels in Falconry. And this is an important enough topic that I needed to remake this video. Uh, but before I start, if you haven't already, if you could please hit subscribe. It really helps keep the channel up and going. And with that, uh, I started this channel. I It was very casual. Still is pretty casual, but back in the old days, I would just sit there holding a bird and talking. And one of the things, if you're a falconer or a wildlife educator, one of the very important principles you learn is you must always be vigilantly aware of what your bird is thinking, feeling, reacting to. And that's normal. You're, you're giving a presentation, you're talking, oh, keep an eye on the bird. Are they scared? Are they nervous? Are they okay? Are they about to poop? Are they about to bait? Uh, what I found is doing those early videos where it's just me yakking, I, I could, had a very difficult time conveying information as I was spending my whole time looking at a bird. And that is the case on my very, very old Kestrel introduction. Because Kestrels are so important to falconry and seem to be uh, becoming increasingly popular, uh, I wanted to do an updated video with more information and better editing software and also not just me holding a bird. So American Kestrels are... First of all, one thing I do want to say also, if you're interested in flying a bird, I highly recommend Matt Mullenix's book, uh, The American Kestrel and Modern Falconry. It's an amazing book. It lays a lot of good groundwork on how to train them and equipment, and it's one that uh, has kind of become a standard, but again, one that I highly recommend you go out and get if you haven't already. American Kestrels are the smallest falcon in North America. Now, when we say falcons, you know, falcons are the birds with very long, narrow, pointed wings. Uh, usually they have to flap non-stop. Most falcons are bird hunters. We're, we're, we understand that profile quite well of what a falcon is. But kestrels in general, if we just say kestrel, kestrels diverged from the family tree of falcons a very long time ago. Now, American kestrels are a little bit different than all the other old world kestrels. There are some genetic studies that make claims that they are much more closely related to peregrine falcons. But looking into some of those studies also suggests that the way the information is being compartmentalized and looked at might not be entirely uh, the complete picture. So that is something that I have been doing more deep dive research into, and we'll do a video later on about that. Uh, whether American kestrels are a very close cousin of Old World kestrels, or whether they are merely convergent evolution, we still call them kestrels. And uh, there's a lot of things that make a kestrel a kestrel. So first of all, kestrels are sexually dimorphic by size and color. This is true of all kestrels. So it is true with most raptors, the female is larger than the male. But with kestrels of all types, you also see a radical color difference, which is unusual in almost all raptors. Male and female peregrine, same coloration, but they have a size difference. Male and female prairie falcon, same thing. Most raptors, you don't see that color difference. So with American kestrels, uh, the males, the male coloration, and I'm not going to get into the slight color variations that change from first year to adult, but I do want to mention, um, well, I will mention one thing. Eurasian kestrels, uh, their first year of life, which Eurasian kestrels are worth noting because they do occasionally migrate to the east and west coast in the United States. But Eurasian kestrels, their first year of life, all kind of look like a female. And then once they molt into their first molt at a year old, the males get their coloration. American kestrels are not that way. As soon as they feather in as babies, you can tell a male and a female American kestrel apart. Now, a male American kestrels usually have a blue cap, double malar stripe with eye spots in back, uh, blue and red on the wings, have a tail that's sort of red with a black band at the bottom. Very striking in coloration. Gorgeous, gorgeous birds. And uh, to the point where <laughs> they're so colorful, we've had instances in my state where injured uh, male kestrels have been brought into rehabbers and the people who have found them have reported it to the government as like, we found an injured parrot uh, in our yard. Can you come get it? And they pick it up and it's not a parrot, it's an American kestrel, a male one. Now the females are much, uh, they're, they're still colorful compared to a lot of other raptors, but they usually have some blue up on the crown, but uh, everything else is much more red and black. 
and I love that coloration. I just I just love the female American kestrels. They are, I think they are every bit as striking, uh, even if the colors aren't as bold. I, I do love them as well. Now there is a lot of variation between individuals um, regionally as well as just totally randomly. I've seen both male and females where the crown has so much blue pigment that there's it's just solid blue. Uh, and But other, I've seen others where there's a big red spot that's more common in, on top of the crown. So you have a range of coloration that can happen. But one thing that is notable enough that we actually see and worth worth sharing is, uh, the, 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 I should say, the American kestrel covers the entire New World. You know, you're going from Canada all the way down to Argentina. And it's our only kestrel, our only native kestrel. As you go south into the United States, into Mexico, Central America, South America, <clears throat> we see a split. And they become either increasingly light to the extreme or increasingly dark to the extreme. And in that, uh, with the light birds, uh, remember, they should have a malar stripe, a second double malar stripe, and two eye spots. You'll see some where the second eye spots don't exist and they have the two malar stripes or some where they just have one really thick malar stripe. You'll have uh, instances where the chest is completely white, both uh, on males and females, with really no speckling whatsoever. And we have other instances of very much the other extreme where you can have some female kestrels where their chest is every bit as saturated with black and red pigment as their back is. So, it, and it goes both directions. But there's still a lot of randomness as well. And this is kind of interesting when we see and we look. Uh, we, you also can look at their tails. Uh, a lot of times bird banders, as well as falconers trapping a bird, love to take photos of the tails and see the different pigmentation on the tails. And there's such a wide range, especially on the males, of how deep, how, how much white can make its way into tail feathers or some that have a blue tail, almost like on uh, Eurasian kestrels. So there's a surprising amount of individual variants. But again, the basics we know when we look at a kestrel is that, again, they both have double malar stripes with the eye spots in back. They both should have a blue crown with a red spot on top. Females, red and black on the back. Males <clears throat> having blue uh, wings with red on the back. Really beautiful birds. Now, as a hunting species in the wild, they are primarily hunter of insects and rodents, but they will also hunt birds. They, they can and do all of these things. They're very opportunistic, and so region to region, now, hey, here's an area where there's tons of lizards to eat, then we're gonna just eat a bunch of lizards because they're available. Or hey, there is some species of insect where their eggs are hatching and the larval stage is, is crawling out on the surface of the desert. Okay, we're just gonna eat a bunch of these. They're just little snacks. They eat whatever they need to. Uh, they are very athletic and are able to hunt birds in the wild, but they don't have the athletic abilities of other similar small falcons. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. They'll develop a lot of interesting strategies. I've observed many, many times where they will key in this time of year in the spring on birds that nest in hollow cavities like European starlings. And they'll say, oh, here's the side of a barn. There's a hole. I see a starling flying in and out. And what they'll do is they'll charge and try to spook a parent to come out and catch it on its way out. But they'll also, if they know the parent's not there, go right in and tackle the baby birds, the baby starlings. So that takes some thinking. That's a very interesting strategy. It's, that's a lot more elaborate. It takes a lot more thinking than the idea of, I'm just sitting up in a tree looking around. Hey, there's a mouse. Nah, I'm going to dive and get it. One of the things that, of course, they are arguably most famous for is their ability to hover. They are the perfect weight where they're almost like a butterfly. Their wing loading is very low, meaning they don't have a lot of weight compared to the size of their wings. So they can hover and they're not expending as much energy as it would take a larger bird to do that same behavior. They are not the only raptor that does it. All There's many others that do, but they are the ones who regularly and intentionally uses it. Usually the idea is, okay, maybe they, they dive, start diving down on a rodent they see. And maybe the rodent moves or gets scared and goes back underground. And so they stop and in one place they hover for who knows how long waiting to see if that rodent will appear again. And when it does, they just drop down and, and grab it and catch it, which is a technique that works very, very well. It's amazing to see how well they can stabilize their head and their vision, even though they are moving. And other kestrels do that as well. I've spotlighted it before as well with Eurasian kestrels hovering in place. 
So it's a behavior that we see with kestrels and is a rodent hunting tactic. Now in falconry, if you choose a, an American kestrel as a falconry bird, usually people use them to hunt English sparrows and Eurasian kestrels. Now these are both bird species that in the United States are non-native and invasive and require no permit to hunt. Uh, I know for, for a lot of European falconers that can sometimes be shocking where in other countries they are such valued birds, but here those both cause a lot of damage and the government is thrilled of any of them that we might hunt with the kestrel. Now, uh, you can, in a kind of traditional, more hawking style, you can walk along and hunt them off of the fist. Some people do car hawking, which is where you approach a flock of sparrows from your car and let your bird go out the window. That is a topic, if you go into my uh, falconry podcast videos, we discuss in greater detail. There are a lot of people who are very for it, very against it, and if you want to attempt it, you gotta make sure it's something that is legal in your state but it gives them a little bit of a surprise, a little bit of a speed advantage, and that is something a lot of people do. Uh, hedgehawking is another thing that I love to do, which is the idea of if you have anything from a stack of pallets to some tumbleweed to uh, a bush that is filled with sparrows bouncing around in there, and if you just walk up and approach, they're just gonna stay in the bush, or they might go out the other side. And so instead what you do is you train your falcon and you go put it on a perch, and you approach from the other side of this bush filled with sparrows and you start swinging your lure around and that is the signal so your falcon starts flying towards the bush and then at the last minute you charge the bush maybe hit it with a stick and the sparrows fly out towards the oncoming kestrel and uh, that is a form of hedgehogging that that's the term i usually use for it that can be really good build a lot of confidence for a kestrel and actually can be a lot of fun you can do it with other raptors as well but it's a technique that i like you can teach them to hunt from a pitch like a big falcon. You absolutely can train a kestrel to wait on and circle above you and try to flush something out. Very few kestrel uh, flyers do. Uh, it doesn't necessarily give them a lot of advantage. They are not as dense for their size. That's why they can hover so well. They're not as dense for their size as other falcons. And even though that does help build speed, it's almost like, well, a little bit of height advantage is good, but training them to wait on is fun, but doesn't necessarily give the advantage it would with like a Merlin or a Peregrine or something larger. Uh, I did mention hovering earlier. I don't know personally any falconer, old world or new world, who has ever attempted to utilize hovering as an active hunting technique. Uh, I think it would be kind of a tricky one to do because it's almost like you would already have to spot the prey, let them go and let them hover above. But they're smart birds. It could certainly be used if it was if it was figured out. That's definitely a type of hunting that could be pioneered. And remember, a kestrel does not have the pursuit abilities of other falcons. Because they're primarily rodent and, inse and insect hunters, their normal thought process is, okay, I'm sitting on a tree, I'm sitting on a foam pole, and oh, there's something, and I dive down and catch it. Or if I miss it, I go whoop, and I land on the next pole over, bob my head, and wait, look around, okay, wait for another meal to appear. It's not like a Merlin where a Merlin, which is only slightly larger than a Kestrel, has so much more stamina. And they'll be like, hey, they're a mile away is a flock of starlings. I'm gonna bob my head and I'm gonna take off after, nah, 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 build up all the speed, and then go and chase and pursue it. I might chase them for half an hour until I catch one. Very different flight style. Uh, that's good and bad. You could be like, oh, well, it's not as sporting of a flight. But on the other hand, you're a lot less likely to lose track of your bird. It's one of the reasons why kestrels uh, often were kind of chosen as a beginner's bird. When, when I was a young falconer, it, the laws were as such that as a new falconer, you had to either start with a kestrel or a red-tailed hawk. And one of the things with kestrels, the thinking was here they were very common and they were comparatively loyal. Uh, you can fly one without uh, telemetry, and if you're flying them right, you're probably still not gonna lose them. Where some of the larger falcons, they have such stamina and they chase so far, it's like, eh, you don't have telemetry, good luck keeping that bird. You're it's just gonna disappear over a horizon and you're looking for your bird and it's looking for you. Um, but still, that's still, a lot of people do now use microtransmitters to fly on kestrels. So, and that is okay, that is a wise way to do it. As far as equipment, the general rule with American kestrels is keep it small, keep it delicate. As small and as delicate as you can. There's a lot of different ways. Uh, Matt Mullenix's book on American kestrels has some good options. I do different types of jesses myself. I do uh, uh, eyelets instead of grommets on my anklets. 
and I use uh, Wallaby Hide, which is a super, super delicate, but super strong. It's uh, even smaller than, um, see, that's a, my Wallaby Hide right there. <laughs> uh, wallaby Hide, it's just, it's even more, it, Kangaroo Hide is what we love to use in falconry. Wallabies are relatives of kangaroos, but smaller and more delicate. So just remember, any equipment you use of any kind, a hood, a leash, chest, a swivel, anything, a perch, small, delicate. These are birds that are that, that need lightweight equipment that will do the job, but is as lightweight as possible. For weight manage management, you absolutely have to have a digital scale that will weigh in grams or even smaller increments. I I just use grams. Uh, some of the old timers are like, oh, grams, well, that's a, why do you need it that small? And then some of the newer falconers are like, oh, I would never use some, as large of an increment as a grab. I want tenth of a gram. And it's like, eh, for me, all the Kesters I've flown successfully have done just fine with a gram scale, a digital gram scale. Uh, but I also choose to always keep them indoors. I have a couple reasons. First of all, I like to keep my Kestrels as social as possible. Even though they're predatory birds, Kestrels are lower on the food chain. And the more time they have, and that, remember, the lower you are, are, are on the food chain, the more prone to being skittish, nervous, and distrusting. And even though Kestrels are known to, to build trust very fast, I want to invest in that as much as possible. So keeping them indoors keeps them super social, but it also makes for precision weight management. Uh, if, in, if outside you have, good heavens, I'm in Utah, and like yesterday it was 96 degrees, today it's in the 50s. Like, that, if you're, if you're having 40, 50 degree changes out of the blue, uh, that can affect your weight management but if you're like hey it's always the same temperature indoors then that makes for a much more predictable and safe flight uh and weight management kestrels can die very easily uh if your weight management is off by only a few grams and so for me it's a no-brainer having an indoor setup and keeping the bird indoors keeps them social keeps my weight management perfect now if you are in the united states and you're trying to acquire an American kestrel through trapping, there's a couple of traps that are normally used. Now, the, the Dogaza trap is the trap to suspend a net that removes, and I've got videos on this specifically you can look up on my channel, but that the net trap can work pretty well for catching kestrels, but kestrels, as they are not as dense as other falcons, when they go to dive through, sometimes are able to whoop, go over it, hover over the, the bait, and just dive down on it. So even though Dogazas do work, I don't prefer them for Kestrels. Usually, what I prefer to do is the Ball Chattery Trap, which is just a cage with a rodent inside, and you have uh, fishing line nooses all over the outside. And again, you can uh, look up my videos on how to tie these nooses and how to make these traps. But basically, the you put it out, the kestrel is like, oh, there's a mouse in there. Can I get that mouse or that rat or that gerbil? Dives down, walks around, gets his toe caught, and then you run out and pick him up, and you've got your bird. So that's kind of the basics of you. There are other traps you can do as well, but those are really the two best. It's, it's fairly cut and dry. Uh, American kestrels are a lot of fun. When I was a child, they were put down by a lot of the uh, more experienced falconers, and they were just viewed as a toy. And I am really happy that uh, that fa new falconers have given them a chance. I'm really grateful that Matt Molnix's book on kestrels has helped increase their popularity and broadened their use. I, it, it makes me so happy to see people flying them. So uh, I hope this video gives you a good quick introduction to this species. If you have any questions about kestrels, let me know. Or if you would like to share your experiences with kestrels, American kestrels, or old world kestrel species, I love I love always when we have uh, foreign falconers on here sharing and comparing and contrasting the differences. Uh, I, it's always one of my favorite things about these videos. So, um, But I hope this video proves useful. Uh, if you haven't already, please hit subscribe. And as always, happy hawking.